I think we're on. Matthew, are you there? Hello and welcome to the wonders of the webinar. My name is Bernadette Nunn and on behalf of the Geelong Regional Library Corporation, I'd like to welcome you to tonight's event, Who Needs the ABC with Matthew Rickardson. Hello, Matthew. The Geelong Regional Library Corporation acknowledges Wadawurrung and Eastern Ma as the original owners of the lands on which its library services operate. The library pays respect to Wadawurrung and Eastern Ma elders, past, present and emerging. It acknowledges and celebrates the First Nations peoples of this land as the custodians of learning, literacy, knowledge and story. I'm coming to you from the lands of the Tungurung and Jajawurrung, and I'd like to pay my respects too to their storytellers and to all their people. And Matthew, where are you joining us from tonight? Yes, I'm joining from the lands of the Bunwurrung people of the Kulin Nations, and I would also like to pay my respects to their elders, past, present and emerging. Before we continue or start our chat, Matthew, some brief housekeeping reminders to everyone here tonight. We would love you to participate in our conversation. All you have to do is click on that Q&A button that it is at the bottom there, the Q&A button at the bottom, and type your question or comment in there. If you're using an iPad or an iPhone, you might need to touch the screen first so that that Q&A function pops up for you to see it. I'm really happy if you want to give it a test now and tell us where you're joining us from. You don't have to wait till the end to ask questions. Just type it in as we go in that Q&A section and we'll fit in as many as we can. Uh, you can also vote on each other's questions, which is a new and exciting feature. So um, that will help us prioritise the things that you're particularly interested in us addressing. And of course, we are recording this discussion. So if you'd like to watch or listen again, or recommend it to friends and family. It will be uploaded to the library's YouTube channel in the next couple of days. Well, I'm very pleased to have been invited to facilitate tonight's conversation with Matthew Rickardson. Matthew is an academic author and journalist. He's head of the communication group at Deakin University. He ran the journalism program at RMIT for 11 years and was the University of Canberra's inaugural professor of journalism. He assisted the former federal court judge Ray Finkelstein QC in the independent media inquiry that reported to the federal government in 2012. And in his spare time, Matthew has also written, co-written or edited uh, six previous books. So this is his seventh. Welcome, Matthew. Thanks very much, Bernadette. Lovely to be here. And welcome to all of you too. Um, in the interest of total journalistic disclosure, I should also let you know that I teach journalism with Matthew at Deakin. And before I started teaching journalism, I worked at the ABC for 13 years, uh, primarily in the ABC's international uh, TV channel, Australia Network. You couldn't see it in Australia, but we broadcast to 46 countries across Asia and the Pacific from India to Tahiti. Um, I left just before the federal government axed the network's funding, which was part of an overall 1% funding cut in um, 2014 to the entire ABC. And I want to assure you that in spite of all of that, we will talk about the ABC from lots of angles for and against. I've also worked in commercial TV and print, but you've only ever worked for commercial newspapers um, in your journo days, Matthew. So I know you have written this book with your former PhD student, um, now academic at the University of Canberra, Professor Patrick Mullins. But why did you want to write a book on the ABC? Well, because I think it's an important story. That's the, the main reason. That's why I, I try and write stories in general, uh, full stop. And I, I mean, I, I was struck. Um, you know, a, a while ago now, I was struck by the predicament that the ABC found itself in, and I wanted to work out why it was in the predicament that it was in, and wanted to write about it. So, um, yeah, I mean, I've written about obviously about commercial media as well, in in most recently in a book I uh, co-edited with Andrew Dodd called Upheaval: Disrupted Lives in Journalism, which was about the uh, the cuts that the mainstream commercial media have made in the last decade as they've tried and you know, struggled to deal with the changes to the business model, which is kind of also relevant to this book. And lots of journalists were laid off or uh, took voluntary redundancy packages. So that was all about, you know, the company formerly known as Fairfax Media, uh, News Corporation Australia, as they are now known, and, uh, and Channel 10 and others. So I've written a fair bit about the media over the years. 
Well, with the ABC, where you when you started researching, and we can talk later as to whether or not you changed your mind, which side mm. were you on? Because it is a pretty polarising kind of topic. Were you a fan of the ABC or were you one of auntie's critics? Well, at that time, um, this is a couple of years ago, at that time I would have just said I was a, a, a regular viewer or listener or reader of online stuff. Um, I, I, think, I think what's useful to kind of say at this point is that when you know, as a younger person coming into the media, and this, this goes back some time now to the early 1980s, um, the ABC was seen was particularly controversial, as in there, you probably remember there would be the odd kind of blow up with either government or, or uh, you know, foreign affairs, trade and so on, and that sort of thing where there were controversies around the ABC, um, but they weren't they weren't there all the time. And generally speaking, and I am talking generally, the ABC was seen as kind of safe, um, middle of the road in kind of both a good sense and in a bad sense, uh, reliable, had lots of programming, dramas, comedies, um, many of which were were appealed to to lots and lots of people. Some of which which were a bit edgier comedy programs and so on. But it was. It, that was the way it was seen, and and for a good, I'd say, two decades, that was that didn't change a great deal, and then as as the media model changed, and I'm happy to kind of go into this in a bit more detail, one one of the effects of the of the changes to the way in which the media's business model operates is that there's huge competition for people's attention. Now that might sound a bit odd in the sense that. Presumably, the media has always been trying to get people's attention, which they have, but they particularly, that is the media particularly needs that now because that's where more of their revenue is coming from as the classified advertising revenue that they used to get has diminished and kind of been hoovered out of the room by Facebook and Google. So, you know, Sean Kelly, who's recently written a book about um, uh, Scott Morrison, the Prime Minister, commented some years ago that um, what, one of the things this meant is that the media became um, full of opinions and far less news, as in straight news reporting. And one of the reasons for that is that, um, and, and you would know this, Bernadette, in, from your career, uh, news takes time and energy to gather. And, and in the case of broadcast media, it's physical, you know, taking equipment to locations and so on and so on. Um, opinions, you'll have to, uh, how, how can I put this politely, um, opinions like bums, everyone's got one, okay, and so it's a very cheap way to produce content, and uh, and, and that what that means is that things uh, become a lot more breathless and a lot more shouty, and so, and if we've seen nothing else from this election campaign that we're going through right now, it's breathless and shouty, and that that those words are not mine, those words are actually the words of Catherine Murphy, who writes about politics for Guardian Australia, uh, but she said that about four or five years ago, and and it's only uh, increased and magnified since then. Mm. So when though has that really changed? I, I, I guess was it that, that the two things happening in terms of the rise of digital media and that dismantling the business model for um, traditional media, as we would used to call it then. Um, and then also that rise at the same time of increased opinion and then the advent of social media. Is that when we really trace back this um, or, or has that increased um, the criticism of the ABC? Because it feels to me that the public discourse um, has only got louder and, and louder. Um, is it just that there's yeah. more channels and it is more shouty? Uh, that's part of it. Um, but one of the groups of people doing the shouting are the media. Okay, yes, you can see an awful lot of noise on social media from anyone and everyone. You know, we're all free to shout as much as we wish to on social media. But the uh, there is a lot more of that from the commercial media. And and so at the same time as that is happening, I, I reckon that's from about 2010 on. You can really see that, that kind of increasing. Um, the other thing that's happened is that while the uh, commercial media had a business model problem, um, that is, they, they've got to make money. They've got to, make, whether they make it from advertising or from selling their actual product, they've got to make money to survive. So, okay, so when Facebook and Google start taking a lot of their money away, you know, they've got a problem. So they've got a business model problem. The ABC didn't have a business model problem. 
because they're funded by the government, I by all of us, by taxpayers originally. So, so um, they don't have that problem. And in addition, they are only too happy, and they were only too happy, to give all of their content away for free. You know, whether it's whether it's on uh, radio and television, whether it's through iView, you know, and catch up uh, facilities like that, whether it's podcasting of their programs, which then have a life that's longer and deeper than they were just originally a 30 minute program on the radio, whether it's online, which is there kind of forever. Um, so you put those two things together and they look like a more significant threat to the commercial media than they used to. You know, if we go back to the kind of 1980s, the um, when I started in the media, you know, Channel 9 was the kingpin and they let everyone know that regularly um, in terms of commercial heft, in terms of stars, big programs, big names, etc. The ABC was the kind of third banana in that sense. Now, the sevens and nines and tens have also got a business model problem and they see the ABC's breadth, its reach is so much bigger than it used to be because of online and because, you know, um, but under former managing director Mark Scott, but not only him, he, you know, energized and, and let a lot of people start doing a whole lot of things. They, they you know, they're, they're much more, they being the ABC, are much more present on Facebook, on Instagram, on other social media forms. Uh, Rod Sims, who launched this book, you know, Who Needs the ABC um, a little while ago in Melbourne, he said he, in his view, uh, ABC online and the amount of content that's there in news and opinion and, and other features and so on, actually its reach dwarfs even that of News Corp Australia's newspapers, which as we know, extend right around the country. So that is definitely more threatening to the commercial media and at least some parts of our commercial media, when they're threatened commercially, their, their response is to attack whoever they think is is the cause of the problem. So that's one of the that is one of the main reasons why you've got so much noise now. Um, I mean, you cannot you cannot pick up a copy of the Australian uh, without seeing almost daily criticism of the ABC. You well, know, some, some of which clearly is merited, but much of which is kind of absolutely not. It's just driven by a very strong uh, commercial agenda on the part of of, of that company. And obviously, the two of the main criticisms of the ABC, by no means the only ones, are that it's a waste of taxpayers' money, that the money should be better spent somewhere else, but also the um, systemic claims of systemic left-wing bias. And obviously, here we're mainly talking about the ABC's news coverage. The ABC is far more than that, and we will talk about that too. Um, so talking about The Australian just this week, Jared Henderson's um, column wrote that um, the taxpayer-funded public broadcaster is a conservative free zone, the ABC of unbalanced reporting, the headline read, um, and wrote, so many ABC journalists want the incumbent government to be defeated. So what did you find in your research? Is um, the ABC fundamentally biased? Are the ABC's journalists and therefore its journalism left-leaning? What's the evidence? Well, there's very, there's there's very little evidence. I mean, you you know you can find an individual program that was either poorly made, or you might think you know it it's biased in some way. I would say I would kind of preface anything we say about the topic of bias is that it's one of my most hated four letter words in the English language. I just think it is such a complicated issue to unpack and. Almost everybody thinks everybody else is biased and they fail to see their own biases. And, you know, I'm, I'm sure I am guilty of that. Um, I, I would hope I'm less guilty of it than some. And, you know, you've mentioned Jared Henderson and one, he is one of the most vociferous and most longstanding um, and uh, critics of the ABC. There are others, but he's certainly one. And so one of the things we did for the book was um, ask a research assistant to look at 10 years worth of Jared Henderson's media watchdog. And uh, in fact, there's so much of it. There's so many, there are about six to 7,000 words per weekly issue. To look at a full 10 years worth was almost impossible. So we did a sample of one per month over 10 years. And what, what we found is that, uh, you know, there's A, there's a huge amount of, of items that Jared Henderson devotes to the ABC. It was about a thousand or just under a thousand over that period, remembering sample one in four. B, 
But if you look at how many of those articles are positive towards the ABC overall, how many are negative and how many are neutral, you know, in the positive column was about 4% or 5%. In the negative column was 94%. Um, now, Jared Henderson, if you've read any of what he has to say about various things, he's always talking about, and you've just quoted um, one instance of it, he's always talking about how imbalanced the ABC is. And I don't know about you, but it seems to me uh, 10 years running at the percentage rate of 94 doesn't suggest a fair amount of imbalance on his part, in my, in my view. Well, there were more than 60 mentions of the ABC. I lost count after 60 in this week's column. And I think Conservative Free Zone got mentioned five times. Well, I think he has Conservative Free Zone tattooed on his forearm <laughs> because he, he writes that, I'd say, every almost every single time he writes about the ABC. Well, given that example in terms of, you know, what he's doing, but shouldn't the ABC be more accountable? And I guess one thing I, I wonder sometimes whether people understand is how accountable it is yeah. and how much yeah. time the ABC... Um, is required to defend those claims. And I guess then what is the evidence as a result of that? Okay, so, all right, let's 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 look at that because that's a really good question. Um, if you, the ABC is the most scrutinised media organisation in the country, and there is certainly a good argument for at least some of that scrutiny. And that is because like other public agencies or publicly funded agencies, it's, tax, it's using taxpayers' money. So, okay, that's, it's not that that is a, an invalid argument, that is a valid argument, but let's go through it. I mean, they, they um, I'll start with what the ABC does with itself on its own programs. Um, obviously there's Media Watch, which has been running since 1989 and scrutinizes the ABC as it does commercial media, um, print, online, broadcast, social media, et cetera, magazines. Um, if, if you compare that to the way in which the commercial media covers itself, there is a stark difference, as in most commercial media is much more comfortable criticising other parts of the media than it is on turning the spotlight on its own performance. I, you know, uh, if you've seen... Jared Henderson in the Conservative Free Zone um, line written a million times, you will also see in News Corp publications, you know, the most common headline is News Corp audience going up or News Corp post record profit or, um, you know, uh, interview with Rupert Murdoch with his latest ideas about this, that and the other. You will, you will go a long way before you will find a tough interview with Rupert Murdoch in his own publications. Yeah. They can do what they like. I guess I'm interested too, though, in those, I guess, the, the more formal inquiries yeah. Um, yeah. that ABC where he is called to account. And I guess, you know, that, that could take the rest of our chat just to go through all of those because there are a lot. But just give us a snapshot, I guess, as to sure. Sure. How, how accountable the ABC is, how much time that takes, and what is the upshot of all of that investigation? Because these claims of bias really persist. They do. Um, okay, so there's, there is uh, the managing director of the ABC turns up to Senate estimates every time it's called or every time he or she is called. Uh, they need to answer questions on notice, um, which, which can be extensive and can be silly, but can also be very probing, you know. Uh, they need to submit themselves to any inquiries that are set up by the government, whether um, whether you know, for example, the inquiry that I was involved, they provided a submission. Um, and uh, what else? They, they, they also subject them. Well, they, they have since around about 2007, I think is the first election that was done. But since then, they've produced a report, the ABC, which usually runs to about 60, 70 pages, about the coverage of the election. You know, they'll be doing one right now. And that will go to um, that will go to how much time each party has is given, major and minor. You know, down to the second. Uh, it will look at um, tone and a voice and so on. Understanding that that's actually quite a limited tool, and an even more limited tool is just measuring how much time. You would think that um, that if you had equal <laughs> split, you'd, everyone would be happy, but they're not. Mm. So. There are, so they do that each time, uh, and and those reports are available. You can read them, and you know we've had a look at them, and and they they 
overwhelmingly say the bulk of the reporting and analysis was measured and and uh, done in the spirit of the act that you know that governs the ABC. They'll pick up the odd thing here and there, as you would with any media outlet. But there's no, there's absolutely no systemic issue uncovered there. You know, again, and I, I make the comparison because yes, you said you know the commercial media is the commercial media, but the commercial media um, also has its own codes of ethics and conduct and its own other other acts which it's required to abide by. And there's an argument to say, which we made in the book, that they do a far worse job in meeting those, in abiding by those codes and in being regulated than the ABC. So um, there's, there's you... plenty of examples. There's, there's a lot of appendices and, and data in here to, so you can sort of dive into a lot of your sources. And I, I found it really interesting those um, that the ACMA, the Australian Communications Media Authority, that you know, if anyone has any complaint against any broadcaster, community broadcaster, commercial, the ABC, SBS, et cetera, that's where your complaints um, ultimately are investigated. And yet that was quite a stark difference in terms of the kinds of complaints made about um, ABC content compared with those made against commercial broadcasters. Well, yes. I mean, what, what came through there was that, that this is a generalisation, but by and large, the complaints about what's on ABC News and current affairs go to political issues. That is, it might be uh, about coverage of aged care or something like that. That's, I, don't, I mean that as well as actual coverage of major political parties. Most of the time, the complaints made about commercial media, broadcast, radio and television, that is, they're generally about questions of taste, like Kyle Sanderlands is a repeat offender saying some you know, egregious thing on radio about someone. Uh, Alan Jones is another offender. Uh, John Laws has been a repeat offender over the years. Two points to make about that that I think are really important. The first is Jones is more overtly political than almost all other commercial broadcasters. So that there's that. Um, he is also the most complained about broad, commercial broadcaster. And, and yet, um, ACMA is a, that you mentioned, the Australian Communications and Media Authority is a, is a government funded body to, for regulation. And, uh, and yet it, it's, I think as far as we can tell, it's only ever taken away one radio license and that wasn't so much to do with content, it was to do with financial sort of issues. Um, if, if a broadcaster such as Alan Jones or, or whomever is found to have breached so, the code, yeah, We might, we're going to end up talking about the, re, the media authority for quite a while here. I, I feel like we've, we've gone, we're spending as much time on commercial media than we are on the ABC. I'm going to bring us well, back. Lee's asked an interesting question, hello Lee, in Perth, in terms of accountability, not just those investigations, both inside it with the broadcasting authority internally, um, is the ABC meeting its charter obligations? And one of those um, is, as you said, it, there's a, it has a legal obligation to be impartial along with other things. Do you, mm -hmm. Is it meeting its charter obligations? Yeah, it has a it has a, a, a an obligation legal to produce a comprehensive news service. Okay, that's the first thing. Yes, by the recognised standards of objective journalism, uh, it's it. But its remit is also to to inform, to entertain, and to educate. That's the o, ABC's overall remit, and that also applies to its news service um, within the editorial code of conduct, which uh, which the ABC has. Um, it's also required. To, you know, to scrutinise those impositions of power and authority, whether it's government or the unions or businesses or religious organisations or whatever, it's required to do that, and uh, and and it does. I mean, I think I think the main thing to come back to the point that you were wanting to get out or get out here, Bernadette, is that we've looked at a lot of studies, and there is no no properly conducted academic study that we could find that showed there was systemic or serious bias within the ABC. Now, if there is, happy to see it and look at it and kind of look at its merits, but Does they're, that they're not there. Does that is failing to prosecute its case? If, it, if there is the evidence, um, is it being, I think you quote Andrew Proben talking about um, the ABC being like a puny kid in the schoolyard who's easy to bash up. Does it yep. need to bite back? Does it need to be addressing 
um, its critics that is their ABC too, this story isn't being well, told. Yeah, sure. You can, I think you can make an argument about that now. Certainly somebody needs to be addressing it. That's one of the reasons, you know, we wrote the book because, you know, you had on the one hand, you had opinion poll after opinion poll after opinion poll um, say that the ABC is the most trusted news organisation in the country and one of the most trusted and valued cultural institutions in our country. You wouldn't have no idea of that if you listened to government ministers over the last nine years, or if you read News Corp Australia and, and indeed some other publications. So why, why this disconnect? What's going on here? Um, because you're right, there is, a, there is a kind of now perception that the ABC is left-leaning. I mean, I think one of the most, the weirdest and most interesting things that's happened during this election is that a number of people from the left side of politics are saying that the ABC is actually, you know, cowed and timid and is running conservative or coalition government talking points and is its kind of agenda is being shaped unduly by the Murdoch media and so on. And there, there does appear to be an element of truth in that from my observation uh, during the election campaign. So what's that about? I mean, it's a, it's a very curious phenomenon. Well, and we are, you know, this is the Geelong Regional Library Corporation. What about the ABC in regional areas? Because you, you know, there is also almost a, a split identity at times in that what the ABC is in the regions, how it's perceived and what it offers is quite different um, than a lot of the content that is often judged you know, when we're talking about the flagship services like 7.30, et cetera. You know, that's, the ABC is many things. It is not the ABC. Um, we've lost a lot of media jobs. There are many parts of regional Australia where there is no local journalist, newspaper, TV station or radio, no local coverage at all. So what does the ABC, what role does it play? How And how is that changing? You know, the, the latest funding um, is tied to increasing a presence in regional okay. Is that also getting a bit anti-competitive in terms of the commercial media? Um, well, the commercial media um, have in some ways, in some places, have kind of just vacated the field in, in, in regional and rural areas. Now, you know, there is an argument to say that it's about the commercial viability of what they're producing. Um, it's always, you know, country media has always been slightly less profitable than big city media. Okay, so fair enough. Um, but the, Hugh Marks, who, who used to be the chief executive of the nine entertainment companies, no longer, but he told a parliamentary inquiry in about 2016 that, look, I mean, I'm paraphrasing here, but he basically said, look, we can't make a buck out of regional and rural news anymore. The ABC should do it. Leave it to them, OK? Um, now, who's, who's vacating the, the marketplace here? I mean, it's... Uh, you can certainly make an argument that the ABC is funded for all Australians, like that is that is enshrined in its kind of legislation. Absolutely fair enough. And but you know, um, it shouldn't simply be a market failure broadcaster because if it is, it's simply chasing the commercial media outlets around and around the Mulberry Bush and trying to pick up where they drop off, and they will be going to where they can make money. Um, and and they are and some of their decisions will be good and some of their decisions will be bad and they're also facing some pretty significant threats so that that is not a model for a that's that's a model for a kind of public broadcaster that's basically shedding limbs as it runs around the field there's a lot of criticism about the cost of the abc and it certainly is significant is there an argument to make also that rather than saying take the money away from the abc that we should be as a, as a nation funding more public interest journalism all around the country, including in regional areas, that it's not the ABC or commercial, that if it's not commercially viable, that um, reporting needs to be propped up, supported, subsidised, so that we've got more diversity of reporting from more sources in more places. Okay, uh, look, I would, I would, uh, I think there's certainly some merit in an argument there. There was, uh, uh, most of that argument was run in, the independent media inquiry back in 2012, which I was part of, um, it was given virtually no airtime whatsoever, either by, well, some airtime by government, but virtually no airtime by the commercial media who told the inquiry, we're fine, don't worry about us. And by the way, we don't want any government money because we're worried that that might come with strings, okay? Um, so 
yes, do we need more public interest journalism? Absolutely, we do. Is government intervention through whatever mechanism a way to achieve it? I reckon it's one of the ways to achieve it, but it's in terms of creating good public policy, it's not an easy thing to do. Other countries have tried it by, you know, subsidising news organisations or subsidising people who to buy a newspaper and things of that kind. Um, some places will, uh, including partly at least Australia, will give organisations deductible, um, uh, what's the phrase, deductible tax recipient status, so that if you, if you donate to them, you get a tax deduction. So the conversation, for example, which is an online website, uh, uh, written by all by academics, edited by by journalists, is free to anyone, and it gets some. As in, it's got that status. So if you donate to them, you get a tax deduction, and they get some money. So you know there are ways to do it, um, but historically, and I'm going back the last decade, this is not an area that most of the commercial media wants to talk about. They they don't want to have that discussion. I know because I've tried to have it with a number of people on a number of occasions, they just don't really want to talk about it. It doesn't mean that, that they won't accept some government money. I mean, notoriously, News Corp accepted $40 million in two tranches to Foxtel. It's, you know, the, the pay television arm of the company uh, to produce more uh, coverage of women's sport and other kinds of sport and other kinds of programming. Nothing wrong with that intrinsically, but that money was simply given to them no tender, no kind of, you know, accountability, no scrutiny. Uh, that doesn't seem to me to be a good following of public policy uh, processes or anything. Well, speaking of government and policy and funding, and thank you to Alison McAdam for that question too. Um, this, there's been a lot of criticism by this government um, and certainly um, concerns that it's been a concerted dismantling of the ABC, um, and we'll talk about the Get Up report perhaps too. But it's certainly not the first government to attack the ABC. And in your book, there is quite a litany of stories that you you map through um, historically. Did you of both colours? I might add. Do you have a favourite of those stories <laughs> in terms of um, how um, they've been perceived in the past? Oh, look, I think um, you know, the, the former Prime Minister Tony Abbott. Uh, uh, saying that you know he wanted the ABC to be batting for the home team at, on various occasions. I mean, I don't think that, you know, is that the role of a public broadcaster in Australia? It might be the role of a public broadcaster in China where the public broadcaster there does what the government wants it to do. I thought we had state, a different kind of- Not a public broadcaster, which I think- Sorry, is... state, yes, well, yes, that's right. That, that's yeah. absolutely right. So I thought that was what they had there and we had a public broadcaster, which was, whose aim was to, you know, to provide material for anyone and everyone around the country. So to have that kind of commentary, I don't think uh, helped at the time. This was back in about 2014. Um, he also, if you remember famously, uh, Tony Abbott famously banned his cabinet ministers from appearing on Q&A. And you know, without going back into all the weeds of these various controversies, I think the kind of point that came through from looking at we went back and looked at when the ABC as a commission became the ABC as a corporation back in 1983. And, um, and what we found was, yes, there's, there's kind of tension between government and the ABC throughout that period. Baseline point, absolutely true. Um, the second point is that the, the hostility, you know, you can now map it over that kind of nearly 40 year period is, is sharper and more overt when a coalition government is in power. And we've had almost the same number of years of coalition governments as Labor governments in that kind of 38, 39 year period. And, you know, um, uh, and that's also matched by the way in which the funding is done. And, and we've got, uh, you've mentioned the tables at the back and I, I, I would really like to acknowledge our colleague, Michael Ward at the University of Sydney. Uh, he's a PhD candidate there, and he worked for about 20 years as, a, as an executive at the ABC, and he dives deep into every, every level of source in order to try and untangle the, what the ABC's funding is. And anyone who's done that work will, will know it's a labyrinth. Anyway, he created a table for us, which I think is on page 186 of the book, if I remember rightly, and it shows the 
amount of funding at the beginning of the amount of funding the funding level at the beginning of each term of government that is each whether the Hawke Keating Labor government then the Howard Coalition government then the Rudd Gillard Rudd governments Labor governments and then the Abbott Turnbull Morrison Coalition governments and the graph looks like cross cut saw funding goes up under Hawke Keating down under the Howard Coalition up under Rudd Gillard Rudd and then down under Abbott Turnbull Morrison and you know it's it's it's, it's dark and uh, you can cut it in various ways, but um, a more recent table that Michael's done is even more stark in, in showing that. Uh, I won't bore your listeners with the kind of, you know, the, the 13% here, 12% there, but cross-cut saw is the image to come have to mind because that's what it looks like. Um, thank you for your comments, Lee. Um, just responding to the chat there as well. Um, just while we're talking about government funding, um, in 2018, the Liberal Party Federal Council voted by a two thirds majority to privatise the ABC. We are in a federal election campaign. Is the federal election likely to determine the future of the ABC as a public broadcaster funded by taxpayers? Well, it could well do. Okay. I mean, we don't, what we know. Um, of the coalition government is that they, yes, that, that uh, motion was put through the Federal Liberal Council in 2018. Um, if the Minister for Communications was, Paul Fletcher was here, he would say, well, that's not government policy. And it's true, it's not government policy, but it's a, it's a policy put forward by their, you know, their most senior policy making group, as I understand it, and it stands there. It's not been, you know, controverted. Um, if you look at the funding over the last nine years of the coalition government, it's gone down um, in real terms. Uh, and if you look at the amount of overt and covert hostility towards the ABC, it's been, in our, in our argument, worse even than the Howard coalition government. And that was listeners with a long memory and the Alston ABC war over the over the ABC's coverage of the war in Iraq in 2003 would remember that was pretty bitter back then. So, um, so, so what what would the, what are the, what are we likely to get out of the 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 government has increased the ABC's funding in its trying latest training round, which goes from this year through to 2024-25 by. In, in nominal terms, yes, it's increased it, but it's increased it by such a small amount that the re in real terms, the ABC's funding is still going backwards, and that's even by the, uh, the government's own budget paper projections of what the inflation rate would be. And as we've known, they've kind of been blowing up in the last week or so. I think that it's just um, taken it back to 2018 levels when indexation was paused. Yeah. Well, as I'm aware that um, we've only got a few minutes before we open up for more questions. So I'd love to see more questions in the Q&A section if you would all like to get um, to start typing. But before, or while, while I give you a chance to do that, um, obviously we're journalists and journalism scholars. So we've spent a lot of time talking about the ABC's news coverage and its journalism. But when we say the ABC, we're not just talking about one homogenous unit or its journalism so do we underestimate its um diversity in all that criticism of it as what's its value as a as a cultural institution and to the production of local content outside well of yeah no no good 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 point i mean jim spiegelman who used to be a chair of the abc about a decade ago he once remarked uh which we've quoted that that he thought even people who worked at the ABC, um, actually many of them didn't really have a full appreciation of the, the kind of amount and the range and the nature of all of the content that they produce. And so we've devoted quite a bit of space in the book to looking at you know, the, the ABC's footprint, footprint across a number of fields, whether it's uh, in music, you know, if for people with very long memories, you would know that the ABC was primarily set up to be a kind of music broadcaster originally, very, very little news originally. Um, and But in the regions and in rural areas, as you've mentioned, both news and kind of programs providing stock market, the stock on stock and land prices and things of that kind, water levels and so on. Uh, in sport, the ABC has been a, you know, a, a profound broadcaster in terms of developing national audiences for all sorts of sports, whether traditionally um, uh, sports like netball, which have had a lot of people playing them, but not 
for various bad reasons, not regarded as good spectator sports, but also cricket. I mean, I think netball's a great spectator sport, but historically the argument was who wants to watch women's sport? Who wants to watch netball? You know, blah, blah. Clearly now that's garbage, but that that held sway for many, many years. And, and I'm, I'm, I want to emphasise the fact that it, it helped develop national audiences for, for these things, which it took a long, long time for commercial broadcasters to get that national reach. So those things, uh, whether we're looking at them, whether we're looking at um, other cultural outputs, radio, dramas, television dramas, comedies, um, you know, the Channel 9 people in their pomp, uh, their head, uh, Sam Chisholm used to say, well, you train these guys and then we'll pay them more and take them away from you. And, and Ray Martin is the kind of classic example of that. ABC born and bred, uh, fed very handsomely by Channel 9 for many years after that. So um, the, the, the ABC reaches into a lot of different parts of our lives. And one of the things that most struck us was uh, it's a national cultural institution. It's valued enormously by many, many people and yet it's subjected to this extraordinary level of hostility in a way that the National Library or the National Archives or the National Museum or the National Portrait Gallery and especially the Australian War Memorial are never subjected to that kind of um, uh, venom and, and uh, hostility. And what's that about is kind of one of the things we were asking. Yes, and the other thing we haven't talked about, which is a really big part of the ABC, is the, the children's content and the education component. Yeah. Many I'm glad you reminded me. No, no, that's that's I mean, so true. That. I mean, how important is that when we're thinking about what the ABC does in its entirety and what or important is it to us as a country? Is that something that should be part of a public broadcaster's role? And how important is it culturally? You know, it's really only probably since the 70s that we started really investing in local production, local content, those local voices, you know, not not notwithstanding the massive hit that Bluey has been that a lot of families through the pandemic. Um, how significant is the, the children's and education? Content? Enormously, I mean, enormously significant. I mean, there's there's a couple of elements. There's I won't give you a long background story on the history of children's television in Australia, which I happen to know a bit about. But, um, you know, there's, there's uh, programs like Round the Twist, which was originally run on Channel 7, but then it didn't work in programming terms for them, and then was put on the ABC. I mean, you, there's barely a kid in Australia in their 30s who hasn't watched that program when they were growing up. In, in unique, irreverent, crazy, zany, you know, yucky, et cetera, et cetera. Great TV program made by the Australian Children's Television Foundation. They have produced a whole lot of uh, high quality content over the years which the ABC and to a lesser degree, the commercial networks have run. So there's that, that local development of a local industry that you mentioned, Bernadette. But also then, um, again, it was Mark Scott when he was managing director who lobbied hard for the creation of a dedicated children's channel, which we've now had for the best part of a decade and which is incredibly popular among you know families and with young kids. And that's of course where you know, Bluey has flourished in recent years. Um, commercial, I mean, I know you don't want to talk too much about, but you have to kind of keep seeing it as a comparison here. They are, they were always reluctant to invest in children's television. They just, they were, again, I can go into a lot of detail, but you don't need it. And they're still not that keen on it. And they're trying to get out of their obligations to broadcast both, not only children's stuff, but local dramas, comedies, and so on, because they're expensive. It's much easier and cheaper to get, you know, the latest Law and Order SVU from overseas because it costs you so much less. So this is a this is another debate at the moment. The ABC is is a bulwark of this kind of programming, but there's a whole separate debate that we as a country need to have about our commercial media outlets and our streaming media outlets to do the same thing to tell our stories, to find our stories, whether fictional or, or factual. What did you discover, um, and thanks again, Alison McAdam, for your question about the, what have you found about funding, those funding cuts over time that being across both the television and radio arms of the ABC, not just um, news, are they usually considered together or are radio and TV considered to be very separate entities? We talk a lot about the famous silos of the ABC that each division is quite separate. Well, there's, there's a whole lot of sort of internal warfare goes on there, um, which, Anyone who's worked in areas, you would know, it's you know, it's bitter and all the rest of it. I think 
it, what's more important is that is that it, it cut sustained cuts over time they're not they're not neutral they have an effect on what you can produce and so an example i think is a really relevant one is the um uh is the i think you mentioned it earlier bernadette the friday night edition of the 730 program which used to be called state line that was cut in around about 2014 from memory now that each state and territory produced its own edition on a friday night and covered it you know what was happening in the northern territory or whatever and you know what have we learned over the last two years during the pandemic it's the very very important role of the states in delivering service or not delivering services that we needed during the pandemic and obviously it's not over yet so that kind of scrutiny of what's going on at the state level has 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 definitely diminished and so um you know and i don't think we as a country are better off for that it's actually a, it's a significant problem and and the commercial current affairs programs have have also not done as much of that and many of them have kind of closed down anyway well, one thing that the commercials I don't think ever really did um, that the ABC you know, again trained some you know, world experts in was the natural Hist history unit, which was extraordinarily expensive. It takes a really long time to get you know that particular shot of that species doing whatever in some obscure and remote place. Mm -hmm. But where you know, David Attenborough is a global entity who has a significant voice and the value and the, of the resales of that kind of um, production, but that's something that was in-house and a specialist skill, which no longer exists at the ABC. You know, are we seeing dismantling, I guess, of some of that expertise um, and, and what's oh, left to go? Yes, and, and that was a, you know, that that at least partly, that goes back to about the late 1980s and early 1990s, and, and, and it was under the Hawke Labor government, under the belief in the virtues of privatisation and of corporatisation and so on, that a lot, large parts of the ABC's kind of in-house capacity to produce radio and television programs and whether it's natural history or drama or comment or whatever was kind of was outsourced and so now the people who run those parts of the ABC are primarily working with independent production companies many of whom are fantastic but you know it's a different model and and so the kind of you know the Attenborough model it's very hard to see how a David, where would a David Attenborough come from now? I think is an interesting and relevant question. He, of course, originally is with the BBC, but and and the BBC is historically much better funded than the ABC. But that that I mean, you know how difficult or not how, how time consuming it is to take cameras out to you know Frankston to film a news story. What he was doing of a, was of a whole other order of business in terms of sitting in parts of the savannah and waiting for some animal to pop up at you know five o'clock in the morning or something like that. So, uh, and yet look at the legacy of the programs that he and his teams have produced. Um, so we talked before about um, what we do in the regions um, and what we need in the regions in terms of journalism. Should the ABC do, be doing more other kinds of content in regional Australia? So it's not, you know, because one of the other criticisms, it is just the voice of inner city cafe latte drinking lefties, I think is the um, usual. Um, Self-abusers. You forgot self-abusers at the end there. <laughs> Forgive me. Self-abuser. <laughs> um, so, yeah, I rather than just thinking about it from news and there's a, obviously there's a lot, lot of local radio talking about other things that are happening in the regions as well but is that um something that the abc should be doing more of is other kinds of production other voices and, and that decentralization that it's not just sydney centric as the other criticism goes yeah I, the abc is sydney centric that's one of the criticisms well I'm, you know pick a number and get in line i'm not the first person to have said that uh but but it is and part of the reason for that is because um, if you cut funding often enough and deeply enough then it makes it much harder to fund those you know, far-flung parts of the national empire so, so there's that but yes of course they should be they're a broadcaster for anyone and everyone around the country so they should be doing that um, they should also be doing a more of a range of kinds of content i mean there's a kind of without going into the weeds of it all the um, Life, the ABC Life kind of uh, component, which was designed to do what is called in the commercial media or print media lifestyle journalism, um, but not necessarily connected to selling a skiing supplement or something like that. 
uh, was actually it got it got slammed both internally and externally for a variety of reasons, which spelled its uh, death knell or sounded its death knell. But um, it actually was producing really interesting content and you know really interesting and practical advice about how to get through the pandemic you know how to what, what sort of things you could cook cheaply during the pandemic things of that nature which were about ordinary moments in your life uh not driven by a kind of news value but um also not driven by a commercial value so to the extent that that's been kind of curtailed a bit in recent years i think that's a really unfortunate development and that they, they were doing some really good and useful stuff so arguably it's been slightly rebranded as ABC every day. Um, and I think there was also you know, some, some other voices that you might not have heard from other media. Um, that's well, diverse, there was diversity too in terms of people from different ethnic backgrounds, people from whether they were not able, whether they you know, had a, a, other kinds of issues that just they were reaching out more broadly than the kind of um, uh, white middle-class, middle-aged people such as, well, most older than middle-aged people such as myself. I was wondering who you were going to put in that. <laughs> <laughs> I wasn't going there. <laughs> well, I, it, the ABC used to have a program called ABC Open, which was very much about handing the camera and the um, the radio mic, et cetera, over to the audiences and giving people the power to tell their own stories. Haywired, um, another program in regional Australia, does a similar sort of thing, but the ABC Open um, project didn't continue and, and also had quite a bit of criticism. Is that a role, I guess it fits a little bit in with that education side of not just um, broadcasters telling other people's stories, but particularly in this um, era of digital media, helping people tell their own stories and have more of a voice themselves rather than um, the broadcaster just being the curator, deciding whose voice should be told or not? Yeah, no, well, that's that's um, a trend in the broader media as well, in particularly social media and other online media forms. Um, and the ABC did some great stuff in there in terms of encouraging people to tell their stories. And, uh, you know, to the extent that they don't do that anymore, I, I think they really should. And that's some that's something that if they had a bit more funding, they could do. I mean, the, the kind of funding um, question, I think is a bit of a shibboleth in the sense that people, you know, often say the ABC, they, they kind of pause with a Dr. Evil like flourish and say $1 billion every year. And yes, that's a lot of money. I mean, I, don't, I haven't seen a billion dollars. So yes, it's a lot of money. But it's a it's an organisation that does a huge amount. If you look at it as a as an overall component of the federal budget each year, it's about 0.05 percent of it. And also, and this was you mentioned the Get Up report. The, the Get Up report did a really good comparison and said if you wanted to um, get the same kind of level and breadth of content from the commercial media that you get from the ABC every day for free, other than your taxes, obviously. You know, you'd, spend, you'd be spending hundreds more dollars to get a newspaper subscription, a, a you know, subscription to Stan or Netflix or Paramount or whatever it might be, um, free to air, you don't have to pay for it, but if you're paying for pay TV, you quickly rack up many hundreds of dollars a year in annual kind of media costs, if you like. Uh, you get that, all, all of that, all that kind of content for far, far less money through the ABC. So I, I've always thought there's a, you know, there's an element of that being a kind of, it's a rhetorical tactic rather than a, an actual genuine problem. Well, the Get Up report you mentioned, I think came out in February, just about the time, just before your book was officially launched. And I think um, some of the wording was, it, it accused the coalition of um, insidious, intentional political interference, pernicious bullying, systematically and relentlessly attacking the ABC. So is that Get up's left leaning bias, or we a bit soft in your judgment in your book. Um, well, I don't think we quite use that language, but there's there's no doubt. I mean, there's no doubt that the this government has been, uh, well, at the very least, very hostile towards the ABC. We make the argument it's been more hostile than any other government, and you know I stand by that. You'll you'll have to show me how another government has been more hostile. Uh, so whether you know that language goes to the question of whether what effect is that kind of hostility having through funding, through putting people on the board of the ABC, bypassing the processes 
that were put in place by the last Labor government. Uh, what effect is that having? And you would have seen that the former Prime Minister, the former Labor Prime Minister, Kevin Rudd, had an article in, I think, in, in The Guardian Australia yesterday saying, in his view, you know, he put it floridly, of course, because that's how he writes, that, um, you know, the ABC has been cowed and intimidated by the government and by voices on the right side of politics. Uh, so that the kind of notion that this, its left wing is, is in his view, rubbish. And, and he kind of had this really interesting phrase about how you could see ABC presenters kind of doing a mental checklist as, or I'm paraphrasing to, so if they would say something that they might've thought was vaguely left-leaning, they immediately reach for a kind of coalition government point to balance up. And I don't, I'm not quite sure how that really helps us in terms of doing good searching journalism, asking good searching questions. A colleague of ours, um, Professor Lisa Waller, has also done research demonstrating there's actually right some country. Yes, no, absolutely. A very good research that she has done. Um, and, you know, she looked in, and her colleagues looked at the, uh, was it the, the country. Uh, landline program and showed how it, the way in which it frames the world and the world in which it reports on is very much from the perspective of people working in and supporting the agricultural industries rather than any other perspectives, whether First Nations perspectives or any others. Um, yeah, that was a really good piece of research, which obviously we've quoted in the book. So, with this, um, the book is called Who Needs the ABC? Do We? And what do you want to do about? Okay, we absolutely need the ABC. And what I think we should all be doing about it is talking about it, arguing about it. You know, our, our view is by no means the only view, you know, let a thousand flowers bloom. But, you know, if if you're if you're struck by the kind of disparity that we were struck by between about the ABC, make your voice known in, in this election campaign. It's, you know, to your local member, through media, through social media, uh, because at the moment, some very loud voices, loud, insistent and continuous Continuous voices are uh, speaking nominally for us, and I don't think they actually are speaking accurately for us. That seems to be a good point to finish up. We are out of time. Um, we could talk about this for a long time. Obviously, we're both passionate about um, public broadcasting. There's a lot in the book. It is actually a really entertaining read. It's not just um, facts and graphs so or graphs, so I, I recommend it to you. Um, thank you for your questions. Thank you, Matthew, for making um, public broadcasting interesting, insightful and entertaining. Um, Who Needs the ABC is published by Scribe. It is available to borrow, of course, from Geelong Regional Libraries and you can buy your own copy at all good bookstores and you can see a link in the chat to um, some of the local bookstores in Geelong, the Bellarine Peninsula and the Surf Coast. So um, thank you, Matthew. Thank you, Bernadette. Really appreciate the, the interest and the questions. Thank you all for being here for your questions and comments and on behalf of Geelong Regional Libraries. Um, thank you all for joining us. Good night.